Okay, off we go. So uh, here's where we were last time. So I was introducing some kind of weird ideas here, um, eh, admittedly, right now. I think the best thing to do is to introduce kind of the structure, some of the fundamental concepts that we're going to use over and over and over again, um, as opposed to kind of uh, dealing with each one separately. So again, the big ideas that we're going to use, there is this idea of an accumulating quantity, a quantity that accumulates over areas. It just means the whole is the sum of the parts, such as with mass, such as with area but not to be taken for granted. Certainly doesn't apply to perimeter, right? It just doesn't work, right? When you, when you cut a piece of area into two, you're introducing more perimeter. So of course that's not gonna have this feature. Okay, next. Also, I mean, are arguably quite a bit weirder. Um, when you have an accumulating quantity, you can think of it as being kind of like physical stuff. Not that it is or needs to be, but if you want to think of it that way, right, you can because all you're going to do is say, well, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of physical stuff that I can associate with that region because if I did, how would I compute the whole? Well, as the sum of the parts, just like physical stuff, right? So this is uh, a little bit of a weird take, but the, you can, how, why you would want to, to be determined, right? But if you want to think of an accumulating quantity as physical stuff, you can. And it's going to turn out we are going to want to. Uh, next, if you've got a physical stuff, there, of course, is an associated notion of density. right? When you have density, density is what you multiply by size to get stuff, of course. And with that, your accumulating quantities Little pieces of stuff are density times size, and we've got ourselves some integral theorems, right? So you might call this the mass density integral theorem. And then you might call this the work density integral theorem. Now again, you know, you don't think of work as something that has, that, that's physical stuff. You don't think of it as having a density but it behaves like a stuff, so you can think of it in this way, and so you can think of it as having a density. I know that's strange. Okay, and then likewise in other dimensions. Um, so, okay, so that's all from last time, and this is about where we left off. We introduced this idea of boundary, um, not a particularly new concept in terms of it being the curve, that's the sort of the border between where the set is and where the set isn't, right? But what's, what is weird and new is this idea that boundary is oriented. Very strange. It's going to be critical to what we're about to do. Uh, for the rest of chapter 6 and 7, the word boundary, now this, by, by the way, also kind of part of your job as students is to remember that when you read here the word boundary, you have to remember to think, oh, that means it's an oriented thing. Right? That comes with a default convention orientation. And that uh, convention, arbitrary but standard uh, convention, is that you always go um, in whatever direction along the boundary such that as you do, the region is on your left. All right, so you look at uh, this picture we've got right here. As I walk along the boundary in that indicated blue direction, as I go that way, regions on my left. And over here, at this point, as I go that way, as I walk in that direction, the region is on my left. All right, so that's the rule. Uh, again, uh, arbitrary, totally arbitrary. Could have been set up the other way, but they didn't. Now it's a standard, so we get on board for no particular reason other than consistency. Um, region on your left. Okay, uh, the shortcut version of that that's convenient but also just a little risky is that the orientation is counterclockwise. And you can see, such as in this example right here, uh, when you have um, a region that's, this is what we call simply connected, you don't even know that term, but uh, as you go around a region that doesn't have any holes in it, yeah, it's always counterclockwise. And that is kind of a cool thing. Uh, but remember that only applies to what you might call outside boundaries, such as, you know, here, as we're going along the outside of this region. 
region on the left has me going counterclockwise. But for interior pieces of the boundary, the way I go to have the region on my left is clockwise, not counterclockwise. So this is not the rule. This is a shortcut that works sometimes, most of the time. But the rule is region on your left. Okay, and that's where we left off. Okay, so new idea. Again, just to, just to review. We know now, if we find an accumulating quantity, if I can identify any expression where if you give me an area, I can compute a quantity, anything of that sort, where the whole is the sum of the parts, then I can think of it as stuff, I can talk about the associated density, and I can write it down as an integral, any accumulating quantity. And so here's the new accumulating quantity that we're going to be interested in. This is uh, the accumulating quantity. That's, this is our first, I'm going to call this our first shocker. It's really surprising, but boundary circulation. That is an accumulating quantity. Now, let's just be clear. What do I mean by boundary circulation? I mean, keep in mind, this is, an, this is a quantity on areas. So, for example, if we look at this region right here, this little, what I have labeled as D1 here. I'm trying to highlight it. Oh, gosh, it's harder to color between the lines. Um, that little region, D1, what do I mean by its boundary circulation? Well, I mean, well, let's look at its boundary. The boundary is, see if I can do this. The boundary is that curve. That's the boundary. Note, remember, the word boundary is an oriented thing. Boundary means oriented according to the certain convention. So this is the oriented boundary. And boundary circulation means that I'm going to compute the integral of whatever my vector field is. Right, whatever that vector field is in question, um, <clears throat> I'm going to compute the circulation around that oriented boundary of the given region. So this thing, it's got, again, weird expression, boundary circulation. That is an accumulating quantity. Very strange. Um, doesn't feel like it ought to work. Uh, let me remind you, perimeter is not an accumulating quantity. When you... When you take this hole and you cut it in half like that, you're introducing new perimeter, right? And so we have we should have sort of the same concern here. Wait a minute, when I cut here like that, when I cut up this whole lump into these two separate parts, aren't I introducing more line integral? I'm introducing line integral along this edge. And yeah, well, it's true, you are introducing more line integral. What we're going to see momentarily is that, in fact, you're introducing two new little pieces of line integral. But they're oriented the opposite way. They have negative values of each other, and they cancel. And that's the, that's the thing that makes it all work. So uh, <clears throat> let's carry that through carefully just to be uh, sure we're clear what's going on. Let's start with this region on the left, this D1. Right? Let's talk about its boundary circulation. Uh, the boundary circulation on D1, well, we're going to compute the integral along that curve, and then we're going to compute the integral along that curve, like that. Okay, now if I look at the region D2, that region D2, how would I compute the uh, boundary circulation around D2? Well, again, region on your left, so go along like that. I'm going to come down here like that. So uh, let's see here. I don't think I color coded as well as I should have here. Why don't I uh, let me do this. Okay. So for the green region, we have boundary circulation in purple. For the blue region, we have boundary circulation in dark blue. And what do I get when I add those up? Right, what do I get when I add the purple line integral to the dark blue line integral? Well, um, let's focus our attention just for a quick moment on these two pieces. Uh, notice, for the purposes of the purple, this edge thought of as part of the boundary of D1. In other words, notice it's oriented what we might call upward. Same edge thought of, though, as part of the boundary of D2 is oriented downward. 
Same curve, opposite orientations, have opposite signs in the, in the line integral, and they cancel. So all of that disappears. Right, puff of smoke. Does everybody see how that was canceled? All right, and with those canceled, let me just go ahead and get rid of them then. I'm just going to do that. And what remains, lo and behold, is the boundary circulation of the whole. So as I claimed, the whole is the sum of the parts. This weird expression called boundary circulation has this feature that it accumulates. Does everybody buy it? And of course, let me just remind you. I mean, wh 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 where are we going with this, right? So I, you know, we got this all nicely set up. If you find an accumulating quantity, you can treat it like a stuff. You can talk about its density. You can write down an associated integral theorem, you might call it. And that's what I'm going to do here for boundary circulation. It's an accumulating quantity. Let me. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, it's an accumulating quantity. So it behaves like a physical stuff. We can talk about its density, and we can compute it with an integral. And here's what the formula ends up being for the density. Now, this, uh, there are some little details that go into this, uh, but the density for this accumulating quantity is computed by this expression. Uh, this the, the detailed calculation, ultimately not that big a deal. It is something we could do. But it's, I'm going to say it's details, and I don't want to distract focus, frankly, from what I think is the, the bigger point here. If you have a vector field with coordinates P and Q, the second coordinate, you take the X partial. The first coordinate, you take the Y partial. You subtract. That's what gives us the, our density for this accumulating quantity. Now, keeping in mind that what our accumulating quantity was is circulation. So this is what we call circulation density. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> we're in business. We have this accumulating quantity called circulation. Right? It's a formula. You give me an area, I give you an expression. That's what a quantity is. We've observed that it accumulates. The whole is the sum of the parts. That's all this says. And it has an associated density. And so stuff is equal to stuff per unit area times area. Okay, and the uh, curl, by the way, is the name that we give. One of the names, it's the you know, most common name to this expression right here. Keep in mind the point of which is that it is circulation density. And so we have ourselves a theorem. Uh, we are in business. If you, uh, if you have a line integral around a boundary, a.k.a. if you have a circulation that you want to compute, you can just compute a double integral of the curl operator that will compute the line integral for you. Everybody all right? Okay. Um, let's say a little bit about the notation. Um, there are a bunch of different names for this expression. Um, I really like to push this idea of thinking of it as circulation density. I think that's really critical for understanding where this theorem comes from in some sort of, you know, physically relatable kind of sense, hopefully. The more you think of it this way, the more relatable it'll be. Um, uh, so do keep in mind circulation density. Um, the common name and notation is to call it curl. Um, it is, uh, let's see here, uh, it's part of Green's theorem. That's the name of this theorem, is Green's theorem. And so it feels to me like if this is Green's theorem, then the thing that you put in there to make Green's theorem work, maybe we should call that Green's operator. I don't know. That's increasable to me. So uh, that's a term that I use sometimes. It's not particularly common. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway. And since I was calling it Green's operator, I thought it would be reasonable to use this notation right here. When you look through my old exams, you're going to see GRN uh, as a notation for Green's operator, a.k.a. for this thing that I have in, in purple here. Uh, and so, by the way, let me uh, go ahead and uh, make all of this. 
purple. All these things in purple are all the same thing. Just different different uh, ways of thinking of it, different notations, different terms. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, now I should point out a couple other things. I'll come back to the notation in just a moment. Let's think about the interpretation then, the physical, rota the physical interpretation of curl. Let me get rid of the distraction here. How should I think about curl? Well, it's a density. It's telling us about a certain kind of stuff and how much of that stuff is happening per unit area. That's what densities are. So what is it a density of? It's a density of circulation. What does circulation look like? Right? Geometrically, how do we think about circulation? You can look back in the notes, rewind in the videos uh, from uh, last time, I think it was. Circulation talks about the extent to which the fluid is kind of rotating around a curve. Right? If you have a closed curve in space, circulation is a measurement of to what extent does the fluid kind of flow around it. It's talking about a rotation of the fluid. So if I want to talk about the associated density, all that's saying then is to what extent is that fluid rotating in the vicinity of a given point. All of this total circulation that we're seeing around a large closed curve, how much of that is coming from a given small little region? That's how we think about uh, curl. And by the way, kind of thus the name, right? I mean, curl to some extent I mean, it conjures in your mind this idea of something that's kind of maybe rotating or, or something curving, perhaps, right? That's a, that's a pretty reasonable term. And along those same lines, rote, R O T, another common notation, and you'll see that up here uh, as well. It's literally. What curl does is it measures, again, at a given point in that general vicinity, to what extent is a fluid kind of rotating. So rote, pretty reasonable term. Not as common, but you'll see it here and there. How are we doing? Everybody all right? Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so let's do an example. Um, got a brand new computational tool. Sometimes these, this can be very, very useful. So um, here's a question. We want to compute a line integral. Notice that you're given a curve and you're given a vector field. And so, by the way, for the record, if you wanted to, one thing you could do, I do not recommend this, but one thing you could do is uh, you could take this curve and you could compute it the old-fashioned way, right? You parametrize the curve. You plug that parameterization into the vector field. You compute the line integral by pulling back through the parameterization, right? It's, a, it's just an algorithmic plug and chug thing that y'all have been doing now for uh, a while now, a week or so. So you could do that, but that's going to get brutal. Look at, the, look at what we've got here. Uh, this is a part of a circle. How do we parameterize circles? Trig. That means everywhere you see an X and a Y up here is going to be trig. We're going to have trig inside of an exponential. We're going to have trig inside of other trig. That's super weird. I am not optimistic that this integral is going to work out in a friendly way. All right, so let's not plan on doing this brute force. Okay, so we're going to instead try to figure out how to use our new theorem. Right here, again, Green's theorem rid of all the thing here. Okay, let's see here. Green's theorem. So this being that. Green's theorem. Okay, now there's a catch to using Green's theorem. Um, it, this is something that needs to get uh, dwelled on for a minute. Uh, it's easy to miss if you don't dwell uh, for an appropriate moment. Um, it is at a quick glance, at a quick and careless glance, you might think, oh, okay, so if I have any line integral, Right? Line integral says here I can compute line integrals with double integrals of curl. Um, <clears throat> and that is not what this says, not quite. There is a catch, a sticky wicket, uh, and it is easy to forget. It says right here, it's got to be a boundary. Green's theorem comments only specifically on boundary 
line integrals, and of course, boundaries are always closed curves, so we can call it, and more commonly call it, boundary circulation, right? So the fact that this is a boundary is critical to the setup, right? That's what made it an accumulating quantity in the first place. Right, so boundaries only. And remember, furthermore, this term boundary. Oh, and uh, oh, I should I should uh, mention uh, this is uh, another uh, thing. If I can get this to zoom in, um, for reasons that aren't worth going into here, we use this symbol here as a um, symbolic representation of the word boundary. So when you see that little symbol, that means boundary. All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, do that. Um, so, uh, if we're going to use this theorem, I have to ask. I have to be very careful about the concern of. Wait a minute. Have I been asked here to compute a line integral around a boundary? And again, deal breaker. Right. If your curve is not a boundary, go home. It's, this does not apply. All right. Well, let's take a careful look here. Our curve. Uh, clockwise oriented unit circle, it says. So our curve, what I'm calling C here, our curve is like that. And is that the boundary of something? Well, almost. <laughs> it, uh, it goes around the curve that is the boundary of this region, but it's going the wrong way. It's not, it's not going with the region on my left, right? It's going with the region on the right. It's going clockwise instead of counterclockwise. It's going the wrong way. So is this a boundary? No. And you cannot apply Green's theorem if it's not a boundary. So that's very disappointing. Does everybody see where, uh, the problem? Feel free to, I know it's been a long week, but uh, if anyone has a question, you know, feel free. To, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a question about what's the boundary notation. Mm -hmm. like, yep. So like the it, yes, it is literally the same symbol as for partial derivatives. Sure. Could you also do like a closed or like the circle? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, that's right. I mean, your your curve does have to be a closed curve because all boundaries are closed curves. But um, I'm, I was just pointing out here that that's what this this symbol means boundary, and so then I don't have to put the little circle. On the end. Yeah, the little circle on the integral symbol is actually pretty optional. Oh. It's like a reminder to the reader. It's not essential. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so bummer. I was really pumped about using Green's theorem, and at a quick glance, you know, being careful about this boundary rule, it looks like we might not be able to. But here's the trick. Here's the little workaround. By the way, this, this little workaround is going to come up a lot. It comes up about half of the time because when you pick a curve, it's a coin flip as to whether you're, it's oriented in the correct direction or the incorrect direction. Right? So about half the time, you're going to have to pull this little fast one as follows, going clockwise around the curve is the exact opposite orientation of going counterclockwise around the curve counterclockwise is a boundary. Everybody cool with that? All right. So um, <clears throat> we're going to fix it then by saying, uh, let's see here, our, our curve, we were asked to compute the line integral around the given blue curve. Um, and that is opposite orientation, which of course introduces a corresponding minus sign in the evaluation. Opposite of counterclockwise, and counterclockwise is a boundary. And of course, don't forget your minus sign. So it's ultimately a pretty easy little, uh, you know, it's a little side step around the problem, right? But not that big a deal. If you're going the wrong way, just you know, uh, acknowledge um, I'm going the wrong way. That means if I want to do it the way that'd be more convenient, I owe you a minus sign. There's my minus sign. And now we're in business because this integral right here is a boundary circulation. And boundary circulations we can compute with Green's theorem 
like so. And again, don't forget to carry over your minus sign. Is everybody happy? Okay, it's all over with the shouting at this point. Uh, so, you know, we've got to think about the, the little details here. Uh, it says I need to compute the curl. Uh, the curl is, uh, you know, dq dx minus dp dy. Uh, conveniently, um, the x partial of this is easy. The x partial of that is just 3. And then I have to subtract dp dy, so I have to subtract the y partial of that, but again, Easy. It's just one. So green, uh, excuse me, uh, curl, aka Green's operator. Super easy to compute. Um, I have now turned the question into uh, a double integral of two on a disk, and that's a super easy integral. And again, don't forget to carry on your minus sign. And uh, there's your answer. It's minus two. So super duper powerful. We didn't have to introduce any trig at all. We completely avoided the uh, resulting crazy integral that we would have ended up with with trig inside of trig and exponentials and oh my gosh, right? All that no, not necessary at all. Super easy calculation. Everybody happy? This is a really powerful result. So uh, Green's theorem, super big deal. Um, fantastic tool for computing line integrals. Again, I remind you specifically boundary line integrals, that is boundary circulations, so otherwise known as circulations. Okay. All right, so that's Green's theorem. I'll show you another example. Um, that is a little bit weirder one, but uh, you know, again, this kind of thing comes up. Uh, so uh, we have a curve defined as follows. Um, uh, we start at the origin, uh, from which we go over to two two, from which we go down to two zero, from which we go over to zero two, from which we go back down to zero zero. So there's our curve. It's like a little figure eight, like a triangular figure eight, if you will. Um, and I want to compute a line integral on that curve. And it's not such a bad curve in some sense, right? Each one of these little pieces is a line segment, but there are four separate such pieces. And uh, I don't really want to have to um, parameterize four separate line segments. Okay. All right, is this a boundary? Subtle concern. Uh, it's tempting to say, yeah, sure it is. It's the borderline between set and not set. So it makes it look like it's a boundary. But again, orientations. Orientations matter. It's a really big deal. Is this oriented correctly? It's tempting to say, well, yeah, because look, like right there, see, we're going that way. And the region's on my left. Sounds good so far, except if you look here, as we continue to go that way, the region is not on my left. So this curve that we're given is not, as written, not a boundary. Okay. So the, the slick move on this one for your future possible use is to break this up into two curves. There's that one. And there's this one. And then the big idea is to just realize that uh, that green curve, oh, cool. The green curve is literally the boundary of that left triangle. I mean, full on orientation and all, that green curve is the boundary of D1. Um, what about the blue curve? Is the blue curve a boundary? Well, uh, no, it's not, it, mm, right? It's going the wrong way. The region's on my right, not on my left. But here's the thing. That blue curve, looking only at this blue curve, is exactly the opposite orientation from the boundary. So this blue curve, uh, it's not exactly a boundary, um, but the opposite orientation of it is a boundary. Everybody see how that 
work it so you kind of break it up as needed and I've now got the problem sort of translated into something that the uh, yeah, green serum can get its teeth into. And so with that in mind, uh, we uh, compute the green integral separately from the blue integral. Uh, the opposite orientation gives us a minus sign on the outside there. And uh, now I have two implementations of Green's theorem. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so Green's theorem right there. Green's theorem right there. Don't forget to carry down your minus sign, of course. Right. And now I have the question rephrased as two separate double integrals. Um, <clears throat> by the way, you can compute curl of the original vector field. No problem as being 9. And so I have... Um, you know, 9 times the one area minus 9 times the other area, if I can get this to cooperate. Uh, you'll notice from the picture those two areas are obviously the same, so cancel, answer to 0. Everybody happy? Okay, we, we skipped a bunch of parameterizing. Now, to be fair, yes, this vector field's not so bad. Uh, the line segments, the parameterizing, not so bad. It's perfectly doable by brute force methods. Uh, but uh, it is definitely easier using Green's theorem here. And, of course, the purpose of an example is not to get the answer. The purpose of an example is to show the method. Right? And so this is a method that in cases where the vector field was a lot nastier and brute force calculation would not just directly work, this method could be critically powerful. Yeah. One more time. If we see a pattern, we don't need to parameterize like the boundary. If you see a what now? If we see like a pattern, or like a, a pattern. Pa oh, um, I, I don't, I don't want to give broad statements of exactly when and exactly, you know, when does it work and exactly when it doesn't work, other than the statement of the theorem itself, right? So uh, the devil's always in the details, and you gotta always go through and check all those details. But that said, yeah, if you see some sort of, you know, possible convenience, then uh, it's certainly worth looking at. In fact, I would go so far as to say that whenever your curve is a closed curve, it's kind of worth checking out the possibility that Green's theorem might apply in a convenient way. Absolutely. Yeah. But again, details matter. Yeah. So where did the that come from? Oh, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that, uh, let's see here, let me, um, right. So keep in mind the way that we compute curl Curl is uh, the x partial of this, which is 5, minus the y partial of that, which is minus 4. And so 5 minus negative 4 is 9. So that's just computing Green's operator, uh, 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 a.k.a. curl. Uh, curl here is, is 9. Okay, so it's a super computationally convenient tool. Um, here's a couple of little twists. Uh, first twist, uh, a little clever geometry result uh, about computing area. This one kind of sneaks up on us. Um, uh, we're going to start by looking in the middle here. Let's look at the, that, that equation right there. And you'll notice pretty quickly that's literally just Green's theorem. It's just Green's theorem as applied to this particular vector field 0 comma x why are we looking at a specific vector field and why specifically 0 comma x yeah we'll get to that in a second um, but um, Green's theorem applies to any vector field and it also applies to this one so I'm just written down Green's theorem for that specific vector field What is it that's so great about this vector field? Well, it, and by the way, others also, but this vector field has the feature that its curl is 1. That's the little special uh, <clears throat> uh, sort of the special feature of 0, x that's going to make this turn out to be a really cool result. Why would I care if curl is equal to 1? Well, because then my double integral here on the right is literally double integral of 1. I'm literally adding up a bunch of little pieces of area, and of course that computes area. So what we have then is a little, uh, you know, again, little pieces and connect the dots, but this line integral 
computes area. And that's, a, that's pretty surprising at a glance, right? We have ourselves a not even particularly inconvenient line integral. And it'll compute the area enclosed by that closed curve on which you compute it. How we doing? Are we right? That's a neat trick. It's convenient sometimes. Um, real quick, there's a little notational twist. Uh, Y'all remember that coordinate line integral notation, and I made this uh, this uh, you know uh, usually statement, which is yeah, most of the time. I mean, uh, coordinate notation is not particularly convenient, and so why would I ever want to write it this way? This is one of the situations where it actually is pretty convenient, right? And keep in mind the dx vector here is uh, is uh, Oh, ah, nah. I wanted to be in pencil mode. Just one second. Uh, this right here is dx dy. So if you dot that out, you get integral x dy, like I have written here. Right? And if you look at the choices between these, I got to admit, I, I think the coordinate notation is actually significantly more compact here. And so when you see this theorem written down. Most of the time, it's written down in this form. That if you want to compute the area inside of a closed curve, you do integral x dy around that boundary. That's how people write it most of the time. Everybody happy? Okay. Um, here's another really nice uh, little convenience. Um, integral x dy on a line segment. Now, let's take a quick moment to recognize a straight, straight line segment is not a boundary. <laughs> right? This theorem up here about area, it's got to be a boundary. Straight line segments can't be boundaries by themselves. Nevertheless, on a straight line segment, there is a super convenient formula for how to compute integral x dy. It's just the average value of x times the change in y. Now, this is a plug and chug. Y'all can totally do this. Um, let's see here. You, yeah, there we go. Uh, you, and so I strongly encourage you to give this a try. Not much to it. You just parameterize the line segment. Y'all know how to parameterize a line. Right? Just parameterize that line segment. Compute this integral, aka this integral, whichever form makes you happier. Doesn't matter. They're the same. Right? You have a parameterization. You pull back through the parameterization. Chug, chug, chug. And what you'll find is you get exactly this, which of course is that. And again, nice little exercise. I hope everyone will run through it. Yeah? I'm just curious. Can huh? you do like the integral of y dx? You can do the integral of negative y dx. Uh, it turns out you need a minus sign because we need curl to actually be 1. And if you do y dx, you'll end up with curl being minus one. Um, but uh, but uh, yeah, there is a version that way. And there's there's uh, infinitely many versions, right? Any vector field where um, uh, where uh, curl is equal to one, and you have an analogous theorem. Yeah, I just I, I show you this one because I think this one's hard to beat in terms of maximum convenience. Yeah, I've never seen a more convenient vector field than this. Totally. Um, okay, so we have a theorem about boundaries, and I have a theorem about how easy it is to compute that integral, but only on straight line segments. And the way we put those together is to acknowledge that sometimes boundaries are made up out of line segments. Right? So I can talk about this curve here, weird though it is, right? And if I want to compute this area in between, oh my gosh, right? You want to compute that area? Well, you can just compute the boundary line integral instead. And that boundary line integral is made up out of a bunch of segments, each one of which can be computed by that little convenient little formula. That's the big idea. Is that cool? Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, on uh, on each little line segment, it's no problem. You just have to make your way all the way around the um, 
uh, the uh, the whole boundary. So let's look at this first line segment there. You see it starts where x is 1, it ends where x is 12. So for this first line segment, the average value of x is um, 6 and a half. Um, the change in y, well, y goes from 1 up to 6. So the change in y is 5. Positive, specifically positive 5, because it increases from 1 to 6. And our theorem uh, up there says that uh, that integral x dy on the line segment is just the product of those two things. And if you multiply those together, you get 65 halves. So simple arithmetic, right? I don't, I'm, I'm, I've kind of already streamlined out even the parametrizing. Um, I can just look at a line segment, look at the endpoints, three function arithmetic, bam. Okay, four, um, yeah, four function. I've got to divide by two. <laughs> So super easy calculation, and then proceed all the way around the edge and uh, add them all up. And what you will find then is that that total line integral, a.k.a. the area that we were interested in the first place, this nightmare of a geometry calculation of area there, is just 19. End of story. Is that cool? Everybody happy? Um, Funny little historical note. So my uh, my, my brother is a mathematician uh, here in the department, by the way, same department. Um, and uh, he used to teach at Columbia. And um, sometime not very long after 9/11 happened, the uh, New York Times was doing a article about the plot. Right? They hadn't decided yet what they were going to do with that area, and there was a lot of discussion. That's before y'all were born, probably. Uh, <laughs> anyway, there was a lot of discussion about it, and the New York Times wanted to do a detailed, you know, summary of, okay, here's the situation, here's what we've got, and among other things, they wanted to be able to talk about the area of that plot of land. And it turns out it's not a rectangle, and it's not a quadrilateral, even. It's like a, I don't know, I've forgotten what, uh, what he told me, uh, but uh, it's like seven sides or something like that, and all the angles are not right angles. They're sort of, you know, weirdly angled. Uh, it's a kind of a, it's a really nasty geometry problem to figure out what the area of that is. And so this New York Times um, uh, journalist had to compute the area of something not so different from this, really, right? And he didn't know how to do it, of course. It's a really hard geometry problem if you don't know multivariable calculus. So. The reporter called up Columbia and said, hey, I need somebody who can do math. And they connected to the math department. And the uh, journalist says, give me somebody who knows how to do geometry. And it turns out that was my brother. And my brother computed the area. got cited in the New York Times by doing exactly this calculation. So I thought that was kind of fun. All right. OK, next little variation. Y'all remember flux, right? The idea of flux is that you have a fluid and you have an area and the, the fluid is flowing through the area. Flux helps you understand volume per unit time or quantity per unit time, depending on the particulars. Um, and we're going to define here a really similar idea. If you're in two dimensions, you can't talk about flux through an area because it's not three-dimensional, but you can talk about given a vector field, how much area per unit time is passing through a line segment. It's totally analogous to uh, volume per unit time through a plane. That cool. Just as a concept, you, know, you see how it's kind of the same basic idea. Okay. By the way, you know, when would you care about such a thing? Well, you know, one of my, you know, we talked through some examples of two-dimensional fluids, and I think the fun one is like uh, herds of animals, right? So you have a, you know, uh, uh, million zebras, 
right, all together in a pack and they're running around, but they all kind of go together. And you could describe that as kind of a flow of a fluid in a, in a sort of a way. Uh, so uh, this would apply to situations like that. Okay, so uh, exercise for y'all to fill in on your own. This is the formula for how to compute that flux for a constant vector field over a straight line segment. Um, totally analogous to what we did back in chapter three in the three-dimensional case. This is just one dimension down. It's lovely exercise. Um, give that a try. You're gonna shamelessly copy steel liberally from that calculation we did back in chapter three, except it's gonna be area instead of volume. Totally doable. Um, okay, so we're gonna ask now a more complicated question, and that is, what is the boundary flux um, around the boundary of a solid? So if you have a region D, some, some region, I'm only drawing part of D here, and if you wanna look at the boundary here, uh, and you ask, okay, I've got some fluid flowing. Uh, maybe the fluid is flowing like that per some vector field P comma Q. Um, how would I talk about the, you know, the total flow rate of this fluid through that boundary of this region? And by the way, real quick, I do want to, um, let me scratch off some of this stuff that's a bit of a distraction for the moment. Don't, don't look at this just yet. Um, we, uh, we have a region, it's got a boundary, we've got a fluid flowing, and I want to know how much fluid is flowing across the boundary. Okay, well, let's see here. Um, fluid flowing across the boundary. Uh, we have a formula for fluid flowing across the boundary. Here it is. It's flux. I need to know the vector field. I got a dot with the normal vector, the unit vector perpendicular to my line segment, and then I multiply by the length of the line segment. Okay, there's our formula. But it only applies to straight line segments. And it only applies if the vector field is constant. Right? This is, again, you know, chapter three style formula. So how am I going to get my hands on this harder problem of, um, whoops, a uh, harder problem of uh, a, a curve and a non-constant vector field. And what we're going to do is we're going to cut it up into little pieces. So I'm going to look, you know, one little piece at a time. Take my entire boundary, chop it up into little pieces. And on this little piece, well, it's approximately straight. It's sufficiently small that the vector field is approximately constant. Right, this is our usual move, right? This is how we operate. We cut things into pieces and then we add them up later. So having cut this into little pieces, on that little piece, I can use my formula on the previous page. Uh, the flux across this little piece is gonna be proportional to how long is it? Ds. And what I multiply by Ds is our vector field, which again, nicely constant over that little piece dot the normal vector. Is that cool? Okay, how do I compute this integral? I don't know. I've never seen something like this before, right? We've never seen integral f dot n. We've seen integral f dot t ds. That's just a regular old vector line integral. We've never seen f dot n ds. That's, that's brand new, right? We're, we're kind of dead in the water here, nowhere to go. Um, so in order to be able to fix this, here's the move, really clever move. Um, and that is to make the observation that, um, I'm just looking at my colors here. If you have your normal vector like this, by the way, the convention on normal vectors, they're always outward. When you talk about the boundary of a solid, the, the assumed orientation on the normal vector is always outward. Again, this is an arbitrary convention. Somebody made it up a long time ago. Doesn't really ultimately matter which choice got made, but a choice got made, we have to get on board, right? This is the standard convention. Notice that if you have a normal vector like that, when you rotate it 90 degrees, 
you get the tangent vector. Right? And it's an observation. Perpendicular rotates to parallel. Okay. Um, then you also notice, uh, let's see here, oh, color choices, uh, your vector field, we could rotate that too. Now, it's a little bit weird to take some arbitrary vector and rotate it, but when you rotate that, you get this. Right, the red vector rotates the purple vector. How do you know that this is the right formula? Well, again, let me remind you, rotations are linear transformations. Linear transformations are matrices, all of that. Right. Uh, this is another, you know, fill in the blanks. Make sure you can do this. Make sure you can persuade yourself that the linear transformation that applies to P comma Q um, results in the rotated vector being negative Q comma P. Again, you just have to write down the matrix representing a 90 degrees counterclockwise rotation, and you multiply, and there you go. So this, the, uh, the clever observation that we're going to run with next time is just make the observation that this dot product we're interested in, F dot N, well, F and N are like that. That dot product is the same as this dot product because all I did is rotate the vectors, and when you rotate the vectors, the lengths don't change, the angle between them doesn't change, and therefore the dot product doesn't change, and that's going to allow me to show that what I, whoops, ooh, gosh, uh, uh, that these two dot products are the same as I had here. Out of time. Y'all have a great weekend. See you later. Uh, don't forget about attendance if you came in late. And, uh, yeah, see you all later. Have a good one.